Welcome to another video explaining the universe using the particle model. Well, today's video is about the gyroscope and, and kind of asks the question, does it defy gravity? Is it an anti-gravity uh, machine? I'm going to have probably three videos on the gyroscope. The uh, one here today on anti-gravity, then one on moving up and down, uh, kind of an interesting uh, situation where the gyroscope can actually move up, and then one on precession. When you go to the internet, and look up gyroscope, you often get uh, videos and uh, information about a gentleman named Eric Lathwaite. He's, he did a lot of work during the uh, last half of the uh, 20th century. This is a picture of him lifting with one hand a 50-pound wheel, which is spinning. It's, it's a spinning wheel, and he can lift it with one hand. His other hand is just hanging there, and when, he, when you watch this, you'll see the disc actually go up, around, and behind him. And you can uh, watch that uh, video uh, at this link. Another interesting one, uh, which has a lot of demonstrations, was something that he gave in, uh, I think, Christmas of 1974 to a bunch of students. And it's a long video, but he does a lot of different uh, uh, demonstrations. And, and he tries to ex explain a little bit his thought about it. And the one comment I got from this particular video was that he thought that the clue to the gyroscope was the fact that the centrifugal force, that's the outward force, an outward force from the center of the, of the rotor outward, the, that force was missing. And, and that, ha that was a, a big clue that should help answer it, and yet he, he never gives an answer, at least not in the videos. But then you could go into the Internet and, and, and look at uh, uh, other things like even Wikipedia, and you'll see that almost all the explanations actually start with, this, with the assumption that it's based on the conservation of angular momentum. That's the main clue. They start with that, and, and then they go ahead and develop their uh, equations from that. Well, so I looked up angular momentum. in the. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. Angular momentum is a vector quantity, more precisely a pseudo-vector. Well, you see anything with a word, uh, with a prefix pseudo on it, and, and, and that's a red flag to me. I said, whoa, wait a minute. Somebody's uh, trying to pull something over on, on me, and uh, I'll, I'll look into it. But they claim it's a pseudo-vector that represents the product. Product meaning this is a, a mathematical product of a body's rotational inertia and rotational velocity, which is in radians per second, around its axis. So that's angular momentum is a pseudo vector. So I look up pseudo vector, and, and uh, down here, I, I, that's the answer I got. But before that, I decide to compare it to linear momentum. And it, linear momentum is a vector as well, it, but that vector has the same direction as the object itself. For example, if you have an object moving in the uh, x direction, positive x direction, then the vector for that, the momentum vector for that, moves in the same direction. Well, when it comes to angular momentum, which is a pseudo vector, it has a direction perpendicular to the direction of the object. Well, the question is, uh, what what makes that true or, or valid? Well, so we take at the uh, at the L, which is a uh, the angular momentum L, and that's shown in the drawing here as a vector going uh, 
uh, vertical, almost vertical, and the gyroscope is spinning counterclockwise in this direction. That's the direction you that you think of the uh, the mass moving, the object moving, and yet the angular momentum of that is in this direction. Well, they said it was a product of uh, the radians per second, which is what omega is, and I is the moment of it, also called the moment of inertia. And this is like a, uh, a, moment, a momentum, a linear momentum has a similar equation. Linear momentum rho is equal to mass times uh, acceleration linear acceleration. This is angular acceleration, and this is angular momentum, and instead of mass, it's moment of inertia. So it's a very similar equation. I added the cosine A, which is the angle between vertical and this, uh, the angle of the axis, or the, yes, the axis of rotation, because we're in uh, interested in the vertical component, because you have the force of gravity moving the gyroscope down, and it's this component that of force moving it up. Well, this is momentum, not force. To get force, in this case, they call it torque, not force, and it's the, uh, uh, the change of the angular momentum with respect to time is torque or force, and, and so you have this cha changes this equation to d omega dt. So this torque is uh, upward force with cosine A would be a, a vector going up, force of gravity going down. If they're balanced, then the, up, the uh, upward torque and the downward force are balanced, then theoretically this hangs in space. Now, I added this. This is my, I didn't see this anywhere. This is my assumption that what the reason they claim it's perpendicular to the motion of the gyroscope is because they need an upward force. That's a guess on my part, and I don't want to be critical, but it seems like it's made up in order to solve this problem. Could be wrong. Well, let me get right at the, the particle model explanation. The gyroscope does not oppose gravity. It uses two gravities to work. It needs both. G2, the G2 particle field is the cause of G2 gravity, which holds the gyro together. In fact, it holds my computer together, and it holds the table that the computer is on together and holds me together. This is... Um, I'll explain a little bit more, but it's also the cause of the inward force, which is needed to explain the motion of the gyro. We need an inward force, and G2 gravity is such a force. G1 particle field is the cause of G1 inertia. It's what keeps the gyro moving. Once it's spinning, it keeps spinning, and G1 inertia does that. And, of course, it's also responsible for G1 gravity, which is uh, part of our system. You apply these forces uh, and then use Newtonian mechanics. You can predict where, what the gyroscope is going to do. And we're, we're going to go into that right now. But let's go... Uh, Let's reiterate one of the biggest suggestions that I just talked about was the G2 particle field uh, holds everything together. This is a suggestion. Uh, there is no, I don't have any direct proof of this. It just fits well with the particle model. So we're suggesting with the particle model that G2 gravity is the nuclear binding force, the atomic binding force, and the molecular binding force. It's what keeps it together. And, and uh, what, what you have is a G2 particle field, G2 particles hitting this gyroscope and the stand and everything around it. And as the G2 particles go through, you lose G2 particles, and then you have 
extra G2 particles causing a net force. This is a force vector, not a part. This is not representing particles at this point. F2 is the net force at this point, and you have an equal and opposite net force on this point, and that's true around the whole gyroscope around the, the stand. This is the uh, centrifugal, not ce it's centripetal, excuse me, force that helps determine how this moves. That's, it keeps the rotor, keeps in a sense the distance between the rotor and the center at a fixed distance from the axle. That's the G2 particle field, gener uh, its part in the uh, motion of the gyroscope. The G1 particle field, uh, G1 inertia or linear inertia is caused by the G1 particles that are equal and opposite surrounding the, uh, the gyroscope. Keeps each piece of the rotor moving in a straight line. It's not this is not uh, angular inertia, if you will, but this is straight line. And it, it is a little bit of drag. Uh, drag doesn't come much into it, but there is drag to this G1 inertia. G1 gravity is caught by the imbalance of the G1 particles that are in the direction of the Earth, and you get G1 gravity. That's where we get the net force uh, pushing us towards the Earth. These are simultaneous effects of the G1 particle. These are happening at the same time from the same field, from the same set of G1 particles that is homed in on the gyroscope. The amount of each depends on the geometry of the system, in this case, the gyro and the Earth. You could have a totally different system and you still have the same thing. And as the system changes, or as this, like this, in this case, the speed of the gyro changes, uh, the ratio of some of these things uh, change. Okay, so let's look at the uh, the a rotor, the rotor part, which is the main part. Uh, it's the it's the circular part, and uh, they make uh, these things such that the mass is out here. Most of the masses out here, you have arms here to the uh, s uh, center. But when you, the gyro works much better when all, most of the mass is out here. And this is a s edge view showing gravity pushing down on the gyro. And this shows the gyro running at a certain speed. Uh, the, this uh, usually a very high speed. And, and uh, it's inertia that carries this red point. This, these red points are an atom or a piece of the rotor that we're looking at and we're tracking its position. It starts here. This is the upper one. This is the upper one and it's in the f uh, forward part of this picture. This is the lower one and it's behind the, it's behind the, uh, in the backside of this picture. But the gyro is spinning at a very high speed, and therefore uh, it, it, we can track what's going to happen by these forces. You have the vertical force, which is shown in both cases. So what, what, what you can do is uh, you can take uh, a one microsecond interval of time and predict where is this dot going to be after one microsecond. So if you know the instantaneous speed at this point, you multiply it by one microsecond, it's going to move out straight to a, a, a certain distance. Uh, the higher the speed, the greater the distance. Then this F2 force pushing in literally is the force that pushes the piece back in. And you might say, hey, well, Bob, you're, you're go getting a little crazy here. This is rigid. Well, I'm sorry, it's not rigid. Uh, it's not moving much, but you can take that gyroscope, hit it on the table. Probably not a good thing to do uh, with a gyroscope, but it's pretty solid. But these atoms move. They're vibrating. Uh, you heat it up hot enough that it can melt and separate. Uh, th these things move. So uh, 
but the, when you when you track it instantaneously, one femtosecond at a time, uh, you're not really talking about large distances here. But it, theoretically, one microsecond it moves out in a, in a straight direction. F2 pushes it in, and it reaches a point here. Correspondingly, when you look at that point here, it moves up to here. Uh, but you've got F2 pushing down. Now, here you have uh, the force of gravity. This is G1 gravity pushing on this point and G1 gravity on this point. This is a shorter arrow. This is a longer arrow. There is a, a net difference between these two, meaning that there's a net force. Could have drawn a vector here. A vector could have broken this, broken this up into its components. One parallel with the rotor and one perpendicular. So you go from here to here parallel and then you go from here down to here. So there's a force vector pushing here. Same thing here. There's a force vector here. This one's smaller. This one's bigger. It's going to tend to make this move down. It's going to make this one move up as this one moves down. Uh, so it's good gravity wise this is it's going to go up this way but it's also going to go up that way due to the speed when you calculate the next position you analyze these forces and multiply it out you're going to find out that the particle moves here and then the next time moves here and here all it keeps moving all the way around this moves up and then down in the back, and this one is moving down in the back, comes up in the front. Yeah, and, and the question is, which one is dominating here? That's, that's, the, that's the real question. That's my next slide. Which is dominant? And, and I'm claiming the high speed dominates gravity. When, it, when there's a high speed in that one microsecond period, the red dot will move a greater distance at, when it's at a high speed than when it's at a low speed. G1 gravity will push it down based on the difference between the upper G1 force, which I called F, the forces F1, versus the lower G1 force. And so you get this vertical movement and you get the movement of the red dot around. Uh, it follows the, the geometry of the uh, rotor itself. Because it's moving at a high speed, the, this distance mo of this moves more, gravity moves less. When uh, gravity starts to dominate at lower speeds, at slower speeds the red dot moves a lot less, while the G1 gravity pushes with the same force, so basically the same force, but this is moving a shorter distance, this is moving down the same distance, and you're going to get proportionally more downward, vertical downward movement and less movement in the uh, rotational where the rotor is moving uh, around angularly. G1 gravity, as it becomes more dominant, the gyro moves uh, down faster because its gravity starts to dominate more and more until it falls. Okay, so what happens if the rotor is horizontal? This is this is a simple case, and the only difference here is, as long as the axle or the axis of the gyroscope is in line with the force of gravity, and the rotor is perfectly balanced, then there is no vertical force pushing uh, down at all. It's going to stay horizontal. But the high speed here is going, to, is going to track. This is going to move out, get pushed in. It's going to move out, get pushed in. Essentially, it moves around in this same space. So it's moving around uh, horizontally. It doesn't fall until something changes. The wind vibrations can cause this to tilt, and then you're back to the other picture. Once, once this tilts a little, just a little bit, the force difference between the upper F1 and the lower F1 is very, very small. So it can tilt a little, 
and the vertical force, net force pushing down, uh, and, and this one moving up because this is moving down, is very small. So, the, you know, the, uh, it's, it's horizontal, and then it tilts a little bit, and it stays there. It almost seems like it hangs there for a while, and then you see, oh, there it's down a little further, and then it goes faster and faster and faster down as, the, uh, as this force differential changes. This speed is if this speed is the same and doesn't slow down itself, then it's gonna it's it, it can be spinning real high. But once this tilts, it's gonna start moving down. Friction at the pivot point is gonna cause this to slow down, and as it slows down, uh, the amount of distance this moves gets less and less, and then gravity dominates, and the thing just gets. Uh, <laughs> It slows down and, and it moves down faster. So you, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's the, the way you apply the forces. You look at the forces, you can see that, uh, that it works with gravity. Gravity is making this stay level. And F2 gravity is keeping the, the um, red dot in that circular path, otherwise it would go trailing off. Okay, conclusion. The pseudo vector for angular momentum was suggested as an explanation for the gyroscope to hang in space. That's my conclusion. But with no physical mechanism, there's no explanation of why that should be, what causes that, I should say. So I re basically reject the idea that there's a pseudo vector. The particle model shows that the G1 and G2 particle fields act on a gyroscope in such a way that Newtonian mechanics can explain the strange behavior of the gyroscope. That is, why it hangs in space. It hangs there because the next position in the next microsecond or what interval you take it, it, it stays there because the speed dominates and gravity is a smaller portion of the uh, analysis. You first apply the forces, you determine the next position, and you find out it's going to stay where it is. It's going to hang there in space. And that can be explained by the G1 particle fields, uh, G1 gravity, G1 inertia, and so on. Next video is going to be about a special situation where it, the uh, gyroscope can actually move up. Very unusual. You would think, in fact, with that torque equation, when you speed up the angular velocity in that torque equation, it, it says the, the torque causes it to move up. It would explain why it moves up if I could even accept the idea that torque, that torque is real. And uh, that'll be my next video, and then the third one will be on precession. My name is Bob DeHilster, and I am your particle model guru. Tune in next time when I'll explain more of the universe using the particle model. Thank you for your attention.